was a beautiful song. Do you ever give much thought to what you will do that day when you stand before Jesus? I mean, have you really just stopped to try to picture that moment? I can't think of anything to say other than thank you. You know, and, and in a puddle of tears, just fall at his feet for being so gracious and kind with me. Well, I want to wish you all a happy Sabbath. <clears throat> I'm really uh, excited about this message. <clears throat> and um, because it's something I always wanted to understand. <laughs> so it's a joy to share it. Um, in our last presentation, we learned that the goal of the plan of salvation is our sanctification. That's the goal, it's our transformation. And, <clears throat> and we're learning that God does that through the daily experience. I don't know if you're, is this too close to my mouth? Because I'm, I'm hearing myself pop. <clears throat> and, I, and I issued a challenge to to those perhaps who haven't had a devotional life or have tried and just really struggled, I just want to encourage you to keep struggling. Don't just keep, just keep doing it. But I challenge you, just give God five minutes. Isn't that right? Just start with five minutes. And uh, read a, a chapter, uh, in a, a day of scripture. You can start with Matthew. I want to, if you're looking for a little devotional book, I would encourage um, one by Sister White that's entitled, You Shall Receive Power. Um, one of the things that, as a people, that we are dangerously ignorant of is the person, the work, and the role of the Holy Spirit. We don't get that right, we're not gonna be ready for the second coming. We have to be able to cooperate with him. Extremely important. And uh, I find that devotional is a power pack. I'll, I will typically spend about four days on one page, just reviewing it over and over and just meditating on it. It is very power packed. What we are studying here, what we have been studying, is the three angels message. That's the message of righteousness by faith. God found an answer to the sin problem. He can fix us by his grace and power. This is the message that the world is dying to hear, and it is this message that will end the great controversy in a loud cry. It's this one. We have been learning what is uniquely Seventh-day Adventist. There is an, another denomination in the world that is preaching this message. I want to encourage you to, uh, before I get into the message, I want to recommend three books to you. If you will whip out your phone, your well, I guess you can write it on your phone, paper and pencil. <clears throat> I have read a number. I find that these three are the most accurate and the most helpful. Two of them are small books. One of them's a medium. One's not even a book, actually, it's an article. It's an article written by O.R.L. O.R.L. Crozier. And um, actually, the scholarship behind this is Hiram Ebsen. You'll remember the cornfield experience. But Crozier was educated, and so he, he wrote it out. But it's, it's basically entitled The Sanctuary Service. Adventists are not very creative. It's, it's just what it's about. Um, but Sister White was uh, informed by God that he fully endorsed this article. So right from the onset in our denomination, we had the correct understanding, just we kept forgetting and moving away from it. You will find this actually on the internet. Uh, I understand that... Um, Amazing Facts Canada has actually turned this into a little book, but I can't seem to find it. But on the, you can just download it off the internet, or uh, the Sanctuary Service. The next one I want to recommend to you, and I'm recommending them to you in order to read. This will lay a good foundation for you, then move to the next one. Christ in His Sanctuary uh, by Ellen White. It's a compilation of her writings on the subject, and it'll help you to 
to not get veered off into weird ideas because she addresses things um, and she does a beautiful job of, uh, of bringing out, well, you know, <clears throat> what I'm about to say is going to sound very heretical. So don't stone me till after the sermon. But, but see if you can follow what I'm saying. I'm really not concerned what Ellen White says. I am concerning about what God says through her. D- does that make sense? God spoke to us through this woman. She was given the prophetic gift. So when I read her writings, I'm hearing the voice of God. Does that make sense? Okay, so I'm not going to get stoned. Um, but this is, this is, I mean, this is, these two bo- those two right there are fundamental. The next one I'm going to recommend to you, I feel, is so beautiful. And it's written by M. L. Andreasen. And the book, again, another Adventist title, The Sanctuary Service. Not very creative. You will love this book. He, he brings out the spiritual aspect of the sanctuary like no other writer apart from Sister White in the scriptures that I have ever come across. Beautiful. So I recommend those three books to you. This will give you a solid foundation on your understanding, and it's vital. My brothers and sisters, this is how we understand our doctrines is through the sanctuary. And we're also going to be able to tag out error through the sanctuary. So I encourage you to read that. Um, <clears throat> I mentioned, and I'll mention again, I, ha- I have, uh, God has led me to give a 25-part series on the sanctuary. And it's an evangelistic series, in essence, full gospel, but it's through the sanctuary. And you can find that on Audioverse. You can also find it on American Christian Ministries. And soon, uh, Seminars Unlimited, by God's grace, will be uh, making those available to the denomination. Tim, actually, right now, is working on that for uh, for me. And uh, you will, by God's grace, you will be blessed. So what we're going to do now, this evening, is we're going to take a look at the judgment. And I'm going to ask the congregation if you will join me in kneeling before the master. Our Father, our great and mighty God, our creator, our savior, our redeemer, our friend. Oh Lord, we, we come into this house broken. Father, dependent, helpless, you are, you are our only hope. And, and as we, we gather here this evening on the, on the eve of the Sabbath, we request the blood of Jesus to wash and cleanse us of all sin and filth and that the righteousness of Jesus will cover us. His is the only righteousness that you will accept and we have none to offer you apart from his. Cover us, Lord. I pray, Lord, that you will enter into the precincts now of this building, that you will be our teacher, that angels will walk up and down the aisles to impress our hearts with the truths we need at this hour. Fill us, Father. Pour your spirit out upon us. I do pray. And again, Father, may the instrument not get in the way of what you're wanting to communicate and bring to my mind any illustration you would have me share. Thank you, Father. And Lord, may your words be found in my mouth. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. If you'll take out your handouts, I will read the introduction. And I'm going to, if you don't have one, don't rely on a friend or spouse. You're going to need your own on this one. So does anyone need another handout? We have a hand here on the far left. We have two hands. Three hands, four. Okay, raise your hands. Keep them nice and high. Nice and high. You're going to want your own hand out on this one. Five. Keep them up high so you can be seen. All right. (coughs) 
Then two more. Looks like somebody's going to have to share. Are we out? Okay. Well, somebody's going to have to share. <laughs> That's it. Sharing's good. All right. So I'm going to read the introduction if you will follow me quietly. In this study, we will learn the truth about the judgment. The truth of the final judgment is deeply rooted in the Bible. It is mentioned scores of times. Psalmists, prophets, and apostles all bear consistent testimony to it. Jesus also made many pointed references to the judgment. It marks the climax of some of his greatest parables and is the focal point of much of his teaching. The Bible writers had a unique perspective on the judgment. They did not treat it as bad news, but as good news. They did not view it as something outside the redemptive process, but as part of that process. They saw the judgment as proof that God is a moral God and that the universe has a moral base. They saw it as proof that history is not an aimless and undirected process. To the Bible writers, history was going somewhere. Therefore, they welcomed the judgment with eagerness and hope because it promised the ultimate exposure and condemnation of evil and the ultimate vindication and triumph of righteousness and truth. Does that sound like good news to you? Let's dive into our study. Question number one. Can we be certain there will be a judgment. Acts 17, 31 says, God has appointed a what? A day in which he will judge the world. And we know from our studies from the book of Daniel, uh, Daniel 8, 14, talking about the 2300 days, that that day began on October 22, 1844. Uh, And you know, let's take a look at question number two. How does Daniel describe the judgment scene when Jesus moves from the holy place to the most holy? How many here have ever been to the Miller Farm? Really, that's all. Okay, y'all, you need to get a bus (laughs) and go to the East Coast and do an Adventist tour. You need that. We actually have counsel about that. Um, You will be richly blessed. Oh, and if, how many are familiar with Pathways of the Pioneers? A few of you. Be listening to those along the way. And for those of you who haven't heard of that, look that up because it's, it's beautiful. It's a story for kids. It's kind of like your story are, but add in his history. Powerful. Well, that's, uh, if, if we were in Miller Farm and read Daniel 7, 9, 10, 13, and 14 on October 22, we would be reading the events that were taking place in heaven. Now, what I want you to notice when I read this, these passages, notice the movement being described. And what we're witnessing was the event that took place that day, the transition from the ministration of Christ in the holy place to the most holy. You'll see it. Now watch. Watch the movement. I watched till thrones were put in place. What were they before? They were out of place. And the ancient of days was seated. What was he before? Standing. Standing. His garment was white as snow, and the hair of his head was like pure wool. His throne was a fiery flame, and it's what? What is that? What are wheels good for? Moving things around, so the throne had moved from the holy to the most holy. Its wheels a burning fire, a fiery stream issued and came forth from before him. A thousand thousands ministered to him. Ten thousand times ten thousand stood before him. The court was now what? Seated. The books were now what? opened. I was watching in the night vision, and behold, one like the Son of Man coming with the clouds of heaven. He came to the Ancient of Days, and they brought him near before him. The court now was in session. Uh, Number three, who will be brought into the judgment? 2 Corinthians 5.10, for we must, what's the next word? We must all appear before the judgment seat of God. Now, the judgment is underway, but it has begun with the dead. 
Once an individual dies, their probation is closed, and now they're going through uh, the individual's record. It has not passed to the living yet, but it will soon. <clears throat> you know, I grew up in Los Angeles, and it wasn't uncommon uh, for me to look down the street and see a, a couple policemen show up at somebody's door and open the door. Uh, the person would open the door and the police would subpoena them. <laughs> Excuse me. So I want you to imagine one day you're at your house and the door, uh, you hear a knock and you open the door and there's two burly policemen there and they hand you a subpoena. They let you know that you will be expected in court soon. I would imagine <laughs> the first thing you do is uh, you're going to find out when the court date is. You want to find out what the charges are and you're going to want to know a good lawyer. Is that true? My friends, I have news for you. You have been subpoenaed. Every one of us have a date in court. We need a good judge, don't you think? Let's continue. Number four, with which class will the judgment begin? <clears throat> for the time has come for judgment to begin in the house of God. And if it begins with us first, what will be the end of those who did not obey the gospel of God? Um, what, what this text is telling us is that the judgment begins with God's people first. And why is that? You remember that in the sanctuary, the repentant sinner placed his hands on the lamb. Remember that? Symbolically, the sin was transferred from me to the lamb. The lamb was slain, the blood was caught, and then sprinkled in the tabernacle, signifying that the record of my sin that had been forgiven is now there. So the judgment begins with those who have requested that forgiveness. Amen. The, the lost never enter into the investigative portion of the judgment. So we all want to be part of that, don't we? The lost, their part comes in later, and we will talk about that. But, um, so I, I want to illustrate something to you. Why, why does it work that way? If you will, open your Bibles to John chapter 3. John chapter three, <clears throat> and we're gonna read that text that is so familiar to us, one we never tire of. Let's begin with John three sixteen. Are you there? Are you ready? Amen. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. 17, for God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. Now the clincher here is in 15, and it's the last, or about the middle. He who believes in him is not condemned, but he who does not believe in him is condemned, how? Already, because he has not believed in the name of the only begotten son of God. You see, once we fall in there and we sin, there's no hope for us anymore. We need Jesus Christ is our only hope. I want to illustrate that. Okay, I want you to pretend that we are in a, a, uh, a surgical surgery ward. Is that what they call them? Room? Operating room. And, and I have a table here <clears throat> with all the instruments. And uh, the cloth is folded over. So now I unfold it. What is this area called? It's called a sterile field, right? So if I'm in the operating room and this happens, does the 30 second rule count? <laughs> All right. The biggest danger in surgery, of course, is infection. All right. Now, can't this instrument still perform? So then what's the problem? It's now contaminated. 
Now for this instrument to be able to be used for the intent that it was, it was created, it needs a source outside of it to sterilize it so that it can, so its works can be acceptable. Isn't that true? And it's the same way with us that because of sin, the only thing we can now do is sin. We cannot do the right things for the right reasons without God. It's now an impossibility. The only difference between me and this knife is that I can choose not to cooperate with the process. Does that make sense? I need a source outside of myself to decontaminate me. Let's continue. <clears throat> Number five. Who is the prosecuting attorney? Revelation, is this amazing how the Bible just gives you this imagery? You know, one day I got called in to jury duty and I sat there and listened to the conversations and everything, it was the judgment scene, it was so wild. The terminology, oh, it was so cool. Who is the prosecuting attorney? Revelation 12, nine and 10 says, the great dragon called the devil and Satan, he is the what? The accuser of the brethren. You know, I, uh, I don't know if it was because of my home life or because of my Catholic background, but I had this picture that God was the big heavy that just showed up when you did something wrong to let you have it, and that Jesus was like your mom standing between you and God saying, no, 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 that was my picture I had in my mind. When I first came to the Lord, I wanted nothing to do with the Father at all. I just, Jesus was my friend and dad can stay over there, I'm good. I'll, one day I'll share that story with you, how God got me out beyond that. And so people tend to view God as the one that's trying to find a reason to keep you out of heaven. And that is not true. Uh, I want, let's open our Bibles. We're gonna take a look at some texts here. Let's turn to John 16. <clears throat> if you're at, okay. John 16, if you're there, say, Amen? <clears throat> I still hear Paves page is turning. <clears throat> John 16, and I'm going to read just the first line of verse 27. For the Father himself loves you. Is that precious? Does that mean something to you? The Father himself loves you. I want to show you another one. Let's go to the book of Luke. <clears throat> Luke chapter 12. Luke 12. <clears throat> These are the words of Jesus found in verse 32. Do not fear, little flock, for it is your Father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. Is that, does that warm your heart? And then, of course, John 3, 16. Let's say it together. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him shall not perish but have everlasting life. The father took an awful risk to have you in his kingdom. Beautiful. So God, the Father is not the big heavy. Let's continue to unpack this. Number six, who is the defense attorney? First John 2, 1. My little children, these things I write to you so that you may not sin. But if anyone sins, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous. Okay, so you just figured out that you've been subpoenaed and you have a day in court now you just found out that your best friend is going to be your lawyer. How cool is that? It gets better. <clears throat> Number seven, who's the judge? For the Father judges no one. Stop. Let that sink in. The Father judges no one. Let's continue but has committed all judgment to the Son. So the Father in the judgment is the presiding judge. 
highest ranking, he is present, but he is not acting. He has deferred it all to Christ. Why? Because Jesus entered into our experience and has earned the right to judge us. I want to share something here. <clears throat> it's not in my notes, but I'm going to go off here. This is something that has been lost from us as a people, and we've got to get back to it. This is what I'm about to tell you, because there is no way to understand correctly the message and the power of righteousness by faith without understanding this. When Jesus came into this world, he had your nature and mine. Christ had the fallen nature. A lot of the false teachings or incorrect teachings of righteous by faith is based on this. You see, if Jesus came with the unfallen nature of Adam because he couldn't have lived a sinless life in my nature, then for God to ask me to live a sinless life in this nature would be sadistic. Does this make sense? It would be sadistic. And, and since we have different natures, Satan could cry foul, by the way. You're not like them. Are you with me? <clears throat> I wrestled with this when I first read this. And I thought, how could Christ have lived a sinless life with this nature, with mine? But see, that's the question we have to ask. And I'll tell you how. When Jesus was born, he was not born like you and I. He was different. You and I are born with one nature, the fallen nature. You had the fallen nature of your mother, the fallen nature of your father. You have the fallen nature. Not so with Jesus. He was born with the fallen nature of his mother, but with the divine nature of his father. Amen. Well, wait, pastor, then he's not like us, not at birth. But that's why Jesus said you have to be born again. Does this make sense? Because then the divine nature comes to us through the power of the Holy Spirit. Does that make sense? This is so important. And it wasn't until I saw that that I began to understand how God can transform a sinner and keep him above the power of sin. It's only through the Holy Spirit. Okay, where did I leave you? So, okay, so now we have learned that not only is Jesus your friend, uh, your attorney, but now he's also the judge. Does that make sense? Are you starting to feel hopeful now? Yeah. Is this sounding, starting to sound a little stacked? Listen, if you trust your case to him and yield your life to him, there isn't a chance in a world he's gonna lose your case. So now let's unpack this a little more. Number eight. Our study of the Bible will reveal three phases to the judgment. Phase one is the investigation of the righteous. So everyone uh, who has made, okay, am I gonna hit it there? Yeah, everyone, who, how many here has made a decision for Jesus? Okay, good. So, um, so your cases are going to be investigated. And uh, if found not guilty, you are acquitted and set what? Free. If found guilty, in other words, you reneged on your commitment to Christ, then they proceed to phase two and three. Phase two is the sentencing stage of the wicked, and that takes place during the thousand years after Christ comes to take us home. Phase three, then, is the executive portion of the sentence, and that is when uh, the sentence is meted out to the lost and the destruction takes place. Uh, that is the execution portion of the judgment. Number nine, what are the books uh, talked about in Daniel 7.10. The first is the book of what? Iniquity. Jeremiah 2.22 says, Set, uh, yet your iniquity or your sin is marked before me, says the Lord. So that's one of the books. So every sin we ever committed is recorded on that book. Does that make sense? <laughs> the second one is the book of remembrance, Malachi 3.16. So a book of remembrance was written before him, before those who fear the Lord, and who meditate on his name. So the book of remembrance, those who keep God in the forefront of their minds, 
their behavior reflects it. So all of your good works are recorded in the book of remembrance. Are you with me? We're gonna revisit that. Then the last one is the book of life, Revelation 3, 5. He who overcomes shall be clothed in white garments, and I will not blot out his name from the book of life, but I will confess his name before my father and before his what? <laughs> okay, so if you've asked Jesus Christ to be the Lord of your life, your name is written in the Lamb's Book of Life. The key now is keep it there. <clears throat> Number 10. What is the standard by which all will be judged? Ecclesiastes 12, 13, and 14. Let us hear the conclusion of the whole matter. Fear God, keep his commandments, for this is the whole duty of man. For God will bring every work into judgment, including every secret thing, whether it is good or whether it is what? Evil. So in the judgment, the law of God, the law of love is the standard. I don't know if you're aware of this, but in Gospel Workers, this comes out. I can get you the quote. In the judgment, only one question is asked. Did you know that? There's only one question asked. Did they keep my law? I don't know about you. I need Jesus. I need the blood of Jesus to wash away my past. How about you? Absolutely, yes. And uh, so, but Jesus is life or the law had written, or the same thing in written form, is the standard for the judgment. That's why we shouldn't compare ourselves amongst ourselves. That's foolishness. And certainly don't compare yourself to the pastor. You know, we were told that in the end, many a bright light that we admired for its luster is going to go out. My friends, we need to be focused on Jesus Christ. Um, where am I in the number 11? Yeah. No, James 2.12, so speak and do as those who will be judged by the law of what? Of liberty. We need to be like Jesus. Number 11, what will the judgment bring to light? Ecclesiastes 12, 13, and 14, for God will bring every work into judgment, including every what? Secret thing, including, and by secret, it's referring to motives, right? And Matthew 12, 36, and 37, he will also bring in every idle word. It's just one of those deals, if we don't want to face it in the judgment, we ought not say it. Number 12, what is Jesus seeking to accomplish in his followers, the church, through the judgment process? Ephesians 5, 25 through 27, Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it, that he might sanctify and cleanse it from the washing of water by the word that he might present it to himself, a glorious church, not having what? Spot or what? Wrinkle or any such thing, but that it should be holy and without what? All of these terms, spot, wrinkle, and blemish, are sanctuary terms for sin. And I already addressed this. The idea that we're gonna sin all the way to the second coming and be saved is a lie. So the goal is to be like Jesus Christ, his character. Now, all of us have a different personality. So how that character is expressed is gonna be a little different, but the character will be operating off the principles of love. Does that make sense? Number 13, what happens if a sin remains on the books, unrepented of and unforsaken? Exodus 32, 33 says, whoever has sinned against me, I will blot him out of my book. Ezekiel 18, 24. But when a righteous man turns from his righteousness and commits iniquity, all, what's that word? All. all the righteousness which he has done shall not be remembered because of the unfaithfulness of which he, has, he is guilty and the sin which he has committed. He shall die. Now, <clears throat> the first time I read that, I, I was a little bothered I said, Lord, wait a second. So I do something right and good, and then you're gonna take that away from me at the end. And as I began to understand my true condition better and the work of righteous by faith, it made sense, and I'll tell you why. If I do the right thing for the right reason, it did, it did not originate from me. It originated from him. He has a right to take back what is his. That's why for us to bo boast is foolishness. Apart from the Holy Spirit, the only thing I can't do is sin. 
So if something good comes out of me for the right reasons, all glory goes to God. Does that make sense? Now number 14. But what if I repented of my sin and turned from it and by faith claimed the blood of Jesus as my atoning sacrifice? Will my sins be blotted out and my name remain in the book of life? Isaiah 43, 25. I, even I, am he who blots out your transgressions for my own name's sake, and I will not remember your sins. Does that sound like good news to you? And the next one, Revelation 3, 5. He who overcomes shall be clothed in white garments, and I will not blot out his name from the book of life, but I will confess his name before my Father and before the angels. You know, my friends, God has provided everything to save a sinner. The only thing he won't do is force us. But if we will cooperate with him, there isn't a chance in the world we can be lost. Number 15. While the investigative judgment is taking place, what is my part? 2 Corinthians 13.5. Examine yourselves as to whether you're in the faith. Prove yourselves. Do you not know yourselves that Jesus Christ is in you? Unless indeed you are disqualified. You know, <clears throat> on the Day of Atonement, Israel stopped everything what they were doing. The most important thing for them on that day was to focus on what was happening in the most holy place. That is what we must be doing. They searched their hearts to make sure that everything was right between their soul and their Savior. And we need to be doing that each day. Now, I tell people, don't get stuck on navel-gazing. Keep your focus on Jesus Christ but take glances here to make sure you're on the right path. Does that make sense? This is the way I like, this is, the, this is a good illustration. It's like driving a car. Your windshield's this big and your rear view mirror is this big. Keep focused on Jesus, but glance back and make sure you're following him. Does that make sense? <laughs> Praise the Lord. Let's take a look at the note here. We must search our own hearts and lives by comparing ourselves with Jesus and his law. We are not irrevocably locked into salvation by one initial or isolated act of believing. We are called to continue in Jesus. There must be a sustained, persevering commitment to him, a continuous personal union with him. And this is accomplished by choosing him as our Lord and Savior, how often? Every day. day. Let's now the next, consider. If we understand the key importance of the power of choice in our day-to-day lives, we will have no difficulty understanding the operation of the pre-advent judgment. The one variable is our will. Now, number one is is the outer court experience. Our initial choice to receive Jesus by faith puts us in Christ. At the moment of our initial commitment, Jesus gives us the legal right to live forever with him. Can you say amen? Amen. So, So out here, what takes place here is what we scholars call justification. We come to Jesus. We ask him to forgive us our sins and be our savior. And then we commit our lives to him. Does that make sense? That's justification. This is how we become a Christian. Now let's continue. Numbers two and three is the um, holy place experience. Our sustained habitual choices to keep on receiving him keeps us in Christ in a state of perfect security. Number three, conscientiously and deliberately, We must renew our surrender to Jesus' control, and that's a voluntary control, by the way, on a day-to-day, moment-by-moment basis. This is what the Bible means by abiding in Him, continuing in the faith, enduring unto the end, keeping ourselves in the love of God, and holding fast the beginning of our confidence firm to the end. Now, So out here is justification, here is sanctification. Here is how we become a Christian, and here we find how to remain one. It's every day asking for the Holy Spirit, every day spending time in His Word and yielding to it and talking to Him through prayer, 
justification, sanctification, and then we're gonna talk about glorification. Justification, if you have difficulty remembering what that means, just remember God treats you just if you have never sinned. That's how he views you. Um, I want to illustrate something here. Okay, so we talked about continuing in the faith, abiding in him. Did this thing come with instructions? Let's see. Tim? This is yours, brother. He even left. Is that the problem there? Oh, it's right here. Thank you. Since you helped me, will you hold this for me? <laughs> Thank you, brother. All right, you can face them, and you can come back over here. So I want you to pretend that it's raining. Oh, you can stand over there. Well, you were over there. It's good. And, and I have, and I am soaking wet. And let's, let's pretend that sin, uh, being wet is sin. So I'm soaked in sin. And I want freedom from being soaked in sin. I want freedom. And then one day my friend Jesus shows up and he says, walk with me and I'll take care of your problem. So I then begin to walk with Jesus. And so Jesus walks over here and I go with him. And then Jesus comes over here and I walk with him. <laughs> and then we can face them again. And as I begin to walk with him, I begin to notice that I'm becoming more dry. And then finally the day comes that I have complete victory over wetness. I am dry. And I say to Jesus, thank you so much. I feel great. <laughs> victory is never something that Jesus gives me apart from himself. Amen. Jesus Christ is my victory. Amen. And as long as I'm with him and I'm under the umbrella of his will, he will keep me from falling. Amen. And so notice, I'm not holding the umbrella. He is. Wherever he goes, I go. He's the one that tells me who it is I should marry. He's the one that tells me where it is I should work. He's the one that tells me what occupation I enter into. And as long as I remain under the umbrella of his will, I'm under his jurisdiction. He has the right to give me victory. Does this make sense? Thank you. <clears throat> I remember, you remember the story of Lazarus in Desire of Ages um, when Mary and Martha requested for him to come and he didn't come? The commentary as to why is powerful. She says, had he come, death would have had no power over Lazarus in his presence. Isn't that amazing? Remember the, the illustration of the cup and the, and the flashlight? It is a law of physics that light and darkness cannot coexist in the same space. Something has got to go. As you enter, as you and I deal with the distance issue with God by spending time with him, he deals with the darkness in my life. I remember a fellow, I was doing, a, we were having studies at a dear lady's house. She had a big house. We had 70 people in that place. And, um, <clears throat> and there was a man there who wasn't part of my church. He was from a neighboring church. And after the, the study, that particular study, he pulled me aside and he said, Pastor, I have problems with pornography. He was a member of, of another church, active there, and he says, and I said to him, he said to me, I have struggled on and off with it for the last 12 years. So my first question to him was, brother, talk to me about your devotional life. He said to me, it's sporadic. I said, so let me see if I'm getting this right. Your devotional life has been sporadic and your victory over pornography has been sporadic. Do you see a pattern emerging? So I said to him, I, I said, get desire of ages. Recommit your life to the Lord. Get that stuff out of your house and read that book. Not to read a book, but to know your Savior. Anyway, I lost track of him. It was about a year later. I was at a camp meeting and I saw him. You know, people were all around. So I looked at him and I just said, how's it going? And he threw up his thumb. 
Vic, Jesus Christ is our only hope. Our only hope. I want to show you something that's really, um, that really amazed me when the Lord brought this to my mind. So you know that we talked about the daily experience, right? So every day we come to Jesus. We make sure there's no sin between my soul and my Savior. If there is, I ask for forgiveness and make things right with people. I recommit my life to him every day. Every day I ask to be filled with the Holy Spirit. And then I spend time in his word. And let's just say that on this particular day as I'm doing so, I become aware of a sin in my life. What am I to do? I come back out here and I ask Jesus to forgive me. He's promised that if we confess our sin, he is faithful and just to forgive us and to cleanse us of all unrighteousness. Then I recommit that area of my life to him. I ask for the Holy Spirit that I can remain obedient and I continue in his word. Now, I want to show something to you. What is this? It's the, it's the, this is the courtyard, but what's this? It's the wall. What was that made of? It was a fabric. It was linen. Okay? What color was it? What was the message? What did that represent? It was the righteousness of Christ. Here's the message. While you're in the process of walking with Jesus and he's revealing the things in your life that aren't right, you are covered by his righteousness in that process. Now, if I choose not to repent or I excuse my sin, I leave the process because the righteousness of Christ was never given to excuse or cover known sin. Does that make sense? <clears throat> now we're going to look at the fear factor. Remember I shared to you there's something to fear? We just learned it's not the Father. Now watch, number four. One factor and one factor alone can jeopardize our security and take us out of Christ, and that is our own will, our own decision to do things our way. So one element of risk remains, but that lies within ourselves. While no man or demon or circumstance can destroy our security in Jesus, we can destroy that security by carelessness or perversity or neglect. So the question day by day, am I, crucifying, am I crucifying self and leaving Jesus on the throne of my heart? Or am I choosing to rip him off the throne, place him on the cross, and sit on the throne myself? That's what will be investigated in the judgment. <clears throat> Number five. Accordingly, when our individual cases are reviewed in the judgment before Jesus comes to bring his reward with him, only one matter will need to be investigated. Did this man or woman continue to abide in Jesus? Remembering that an abiding relationship with Jesus is always manifested in a life of obedience to his commandments. And why is that? Because Jesus says, if you love me, that's its love. Number six, in the end, we pass judgment on ourselves. If you need a reference for that, Desire of Ages, page 57. In the end, we pass judgment on ourselves. <clears throat> By the constant quality of our personal day-to-day -day choices, we are now deciding or sealing our eternal destiny. A godly character is made up of thousands of individual choices which we are now making in response to the Holy Spirit's prompting. This <clears throat> helped me to understand why, in the end, so many Adventists, the vast majority of the Adventist church is going to be lost. We were told that and why the Sunday Keepers come in. You see, <clears throat> the Sunday Keeper is living up to all the light he has. So as he goes through life, he's saying, yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. Yet he's training his mind to submit to God's leading in his life. And at the very end, when accepting the Sabbath becomes a death sentence, they're going to say, yes, Lord. But the Adventist, who has all the light, has been picking and choosing. No, 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 no. 
And when the crisis hits, they have trained their mind to say no. Number seven. By the way, who closes our probation? We do. Number seven. At no point in time, either at conversion, (coughs) during our Christian lives, or at the judgment, does God act arbitrarily to override or manipulate our power of choice? The decisions of heaven's court are not arbitrary. It is our decisions that determine the verdict. Heaven simply recognizes them. At the judgment, God takes note of the current quality of our commitment, our current orientation of heart and will, and places his seal of confirmation upon the lifestyle or character that we have consistently chosen. God's verdict in the judgment simply discloses and vindicates the quality and direction of our habitual personal choices. Is God fair? Who is it we need to fear? Ourselves. Summary. As free moral agents, we are the architects (coughs) of our own destiny. Our decisions all along the way are what count, not just those at the beginning. Acceptance of Jesus does not make us into robots. The salvation process is not automatic. Our initial commitment to him does not take away our power of choice. We are always free to choose another master. Accordingly, it is not God's future decisions in the judgment that we need to fear. It is our own decisions, the ones that we're making now, and they are under our control. The note, these considerations should not rob us of the quiet assurance that all Christians may have. They only protect us from the false assurance of resting comfortably in a relationship that has never existed or one that we have since lost. Number 16, when the investigative judgment is done, what verdict is reached? Revelation 22, 10, 14. He who is unjust, let him be unjust still. He who is filthy, let him be filthy still. He who is righteous, let him be righteous still. He who is holy, let him be holy still. And behold, I am coming quickly, and my reward is with me to give to everyone according to his work. And this declares the close of probation. Hebrews 9.28, So Christ was offered once to bear the sins of many. To those who eagerly wait for him, he will appear a second time apart from sin for salvation. And that's when glorification takes place. The note. The removal of sin from the sanctuary is the final act of the sanctuary service. Thus, when Jesus' work in the investigative judgment is done, the destiny of all will have been decided for life or death. Probation is ended, and Jesus returns for his children. Number 17. Is Jesus able to secure my case before the heavenly court? Romans 8.1. There is therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. How often? Daily.